Get your daily news fix by listening to The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Ears Edition. As you might guess, it's like The Daily Show, but for your ears. And studies show that ears are great for listening, so who are we to deny science? Trevor Noah and the world's fakest news team tackle the biggest stories in news, politics, and pop culture. Subscribe to The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Ears Edition, for highlights and extended interviews, available Tuesday through Friday mornings on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your ears on a podcast. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of Left podcast in which we shall learn about some strategies to and reasons why we need to have better political conversations. Clips today start with a TED Talk by Rob Willer, followed by clips from the You Are Not So Smart podcast, Big Think, and a portion of a progressive faith sermon from Dr. Roger Ray. So you probably have the sense, as most people do, that polarization is getting worse in our country, that the divide between the left and the right is as bad as it's been in really any of our lifetimes. But you might also reasonably wonder if research backs up your intuition. And in a nutshell, uh, the answer is sadly yes. In study after study, we find that liberals and conservatives have grown further apart. They increasingly wall themselves off in these ideological silos, consuming different news, talking only to like-minded others, and more and more choosing to live in different parts of the country. And I think that most alarming of all of it is seeing this rising animosity on both sides. Liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, more and more, they just don't like one another. You see it in many different ways. They don't want to befriend one another. They don't want to date one another. If they do, they find out, they find each other less attractive. And they, more and more, don't want their children to marry someone who supports the other party, a particularly shocking statistic. You know, in my lab, the students that I work with, we're talking about some, social po- uh, some sort of social pattern I'm a movie buff, and so, you know, I'm often, I'm often like, what kind of movie are we in here with this pattern? So what kind of movie are we in with political polarization? Well, could be a disaster movie. Certainly seems like a disaster. Could be a war movie. Also fits. But what I keep thinking is that we're in a zombie apocalypse movie. <laughs> right? You know the kind. Just people wandering around in packs, not thinking for themselves, seized by this mob mentality is trying to spread their disease and destroy society. And you probably think, as I do, that you're the good guy in the zombie apocalypse movie, right? And all this hate and polarization that's being propagated by the other people because we're Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> Free thinking, righteous, you know, just trying to hold on to what we hold dear, you know, not foot soldiers in the army of the undead. Not that. (laughs) Never that. But here's the thing. What movie do you suppose they think they're in? Right? Well, they absolutely think that they're the good guys in the zombie apocalypse movie, right? And you better believe that they think that they're Brad Pitt and that we, we are the zombies. And who's to say that they're wrong? I think that the truth is that we're all a part of this. And the good side of that is that we could be a part of the solution. So what are we going to do? What can we do to chip away at polarization in everyday life? What can we do to connect with and communicate with our political counterparts? Well, these were exactly the questions that I and my colleague Matt Feinberg became fascinated with a few years ago when we started doing research on this topic. And one of the first things that we discovered that I think is really helpful for understanding polarization is to understand that the political divide in our country is undergirded by a deeper moral divide. So one of the most robust findings in the history of political psychology is this pattern identified by John Haidt and Jesse Graham, psychologists, that liberals and conservatives tend to endorse different values to different degrees. So, for example, we find that liberals tend to endorse values like equality and fairness 
and care and protection from harm more than conservatives do. And conservatives tend to endorse values like loyalty, patriotism, respect for authority, and moral purity more than liberals do. And Matt and I were thinking that maybe this moral divide might be helpful for understanding how it is that liberals and conservatives talk to one another and why they so often seem to talk past one another when they do. So we conducted a study where we recruited liberals uh, to a study where they were supposed to write a persuasive essay that would be compelling to a conservative for, in support of same-sex marriage. And what we found was that liberals tended to make arguments in terms of the liberal moral values of equality and fairness. So they said things like, everyone should have the right to love whoever they choose. And they, they being gay Americans, deserve the same equal rights as other Americans. Overall, we found that 69% of liberals invoked one of the more liberal moral values in constructing their essay. And only 9% invoked one of the more conservative moral values, even though they were supposed to be trying to persuade conservatives. And when we studied conservatives and had them make persuasive arguments in support of making English the official language of the U.S., a classically conservative political position, we found that they weren't much better at this. 59% of them made arguments in terms of one of the more conservative moral values, and just 8% invoked a liberal moral value, even though they were supposed to be targeting liberals for persuasion. Now, you can see right away why we're in trouble here, right? People's moral values, I mean, they're at their most deeply held beliefs. People are willing to fight and die for their values. Why are they going to give that up just to agree with you on something that they don't particularly want to agree with you on anyway? If that persuasive appeal that you're making to your Republican uncle means that he doesn't just have to change his view, he's got to change his underlying values, too, that's not going to go very far. So what would work better? Well, we believe it's a technique that we call moral reframing, and we've studied it in a series of experiments. In one of these experiments, we recruited liberals and conservatives to a study where they read one of three essays before having their environmental attitudes surveyed. And the first of these essays was a relatively conventional pro-environmental essay that invoked the liberal values of care and protection from harm. It said things like, in many important ways, we are causing real harm to the places we live in, and it is essential that we take steps now to prevent further destruction from being done to our Earth. Another group of participants were assigned to read a really different essay that was designed to tap into the conservative value of moral purity. It was a pro-environmental essay as well, and it said things like, keeping our forests, drinking water, and skies pure is of vital importance. We should regard the pollution of the places we live in to be disgusting. And reducing pollution can help us preserve what is pure and beautiful about the places we live. And then we had a third group of participants that were assigned to read just a non-political essay. It was just a comparison group so we could get a baseline. And what we found when we surveyed people about their environmental attitudes afterwards, we found that liberals didn't really matter what essay they read. They tended to have highly pro-environmental attitudes regardless. Liberals are on board for environmental protection. Conservatives, however, were significantly more supportive of progressive environmental policies and environmental protection if they had read the moral purity essay than if they read one of the other two essays. We even found that conservatives who read the moral purity essay were significantly more likely to say that they believed in global warming and were concerned about global warming, even though this essay didn't even mention global warming. That's just a related environmental issue. But that's how robust this moral reframing effect was. And, you know, we've studied this on a whole slew of different political issues. So, uh, you know, if you want to move conservatives on issues like same-sex marriage or national health insurance, it helps to tie these liberal political issues to conservative values like patriotism and moral purity. And we studied it the other way, too. If you want to move liberals to the right on conservative policy issues like military spending and making English the official language of the U.S., it's, you're going to be more persuasive if you tie those conservative policy issues to liberal moral values like equality and fairness. All these studies have the same clear message. If you want to persuade someone on some policy, it's helpful to connect that policy to their underlying moral values. And, you know, when you say it like that, 
It seems really obvious, right? Like, why, why did we come here tonight? Why? <laughs> it's incredibly intuitive. Uh, and even though it is, it's something we really struggle to do. You know, it turns out that, we go, that when we go to persuade somebody on a political issue, we talk like we're speaking into a mirror. We don't persuade so much as we rehearse our own reasons for why we believe some sort of political position. You know, we kept saying when we were designing these reframed moral arguments, you know, empathy and respect, empathy and respect. If you can tap into that, you can connect, and you might be able to persuade somebody in this country. So thinking again about what movie we're in, maybe I got carried away before, maybe it's not a zombie apocalypse movie. Maybe instead it's a buddy cop movie. Just roll with it. Just go with it, please. <laughs> you know the kind. There's a white cop and a black cop, or maybe a messy cop and an organized cop. Whatever it is, they don't get along because of this difference. But in the end, when they have to come together and they cooperate, the solidarity that they feel, it's greater because of that gulf that they had to cross, right? And remember that in these movies, it's usually worst in the second act, when our leads are further apart than ever before. And so maybe that's where we are in this country, late in the second act of a buddy cop movie. <laughs> Torn apart, but about to come back together. It sounds good, but if we want it to happen, I think the responsibility is going to start with us. So this is my call to you. Let's put this country back together. Let's do it despite the politicians, and the media, and Facebook, and Twitter, and congressional redistricting, and all of it, all the things that divide us. Let's do it because it's right. And let's do it because this hate and contempt that flows through all of us every day makes us ugly, and it corrupts us, and it threatens the very fabric of our society. We owe it to one another and our country to reach out and try to connect. We can't afford to hate them any longer, and we can't afford to let them hate us either. Empathy and respect. Empathy and respect. If you think about it, it's the very least that we owe our fellow citizens. A few years ago, social scientist Stephen Lewandowski and his colleague John Cook noticed that climate scientists and vaccine researchers were both having problems effectively communicating with the public. They noticed that these scientists, they were committing the same mistakes that people in the media often commit when attempting to address misinformation and myths and, well, outright lies. Specifically, they were causing the backfire effect. They were doing more harm than good, and they were doing this left and right. In response to this problem, Lewandowski and Cook wrote The Debunking Handbook. It's an attempt to take what we've learned in psychology and political science for decades now and hand that knowledge over to, and I'm making quotation marks my fingers in the air, the quote-unquote hard sciences. And I'm doing that because, well, as the backfire effect demonstrates, physics may subsume all the other sciences, that's true, including psychology, but psychology subsumes physicists. Oh, yeah. The debunking handbook begins by asking scientists to abandon something, to abandon something called the information deficit model. Well, the information deficit model basically means that, you know, if people have difficulty accepting a scientific proposition, that's because they just don't know enough. <laughs> I love that. As you may have noticed, we were having some issues with Stephen's 
microphone. So I'll be doing a lot of paraphrasing during all of this. So please forgive his uh, audio quality. But yes, the information deficit model is this idea that people simply don't have all the facts yet, or at least not enough of them. And you do. And so this is why people who are wrong maintain a false belief or accept as fact a piece of misinformation. Moon landing deniers, 9-11 truthers, Obama birthers, vaccine deniers, Pizzagate conspiracy theorists, climate change deniers, people who believe in homeopathy and cleanses and that there's still a operating secret Nazi space station or that you can live on air alone. And those last two are real, by the way. The air thing, it's called breath Arianism. Anyway, the idea is that if you just dump a bunch of facts at the feet of these people who have these misconceptions or have faulty information or who just believe things that aren't true, these facts will just sort of break a wrongness spell. If only you gave them more information, then they would see the light and bingo, everybody is happy. The mistake here, Lewandowski says, is it's not what people think that matters, but how they think. It's not that they don't know, it's they refuse to know. The information that you're presenting is terrifying or challenging to who they are, to what they think they are, to their world view. And that is one of several different variations of the backfire effect that he identifies in the debunking handbook. This one is called the worldview backfire effect. Uh, so if you don't believe the Earth is round, then the information deficit model says, well, that's because you just don't know what the evidence is. And let me now, you know, tell you why the, the Earth is round. And then you're supposed to update your beliefs and say, ah, now I know and switch to this more accurate representation of the world. Lewandowski says that this sort of updating of existing models and replacing them when better ones come along is, of course, vital for a functioning democracy, and it's the essential business of science itself. But individuals always resist this, and as David Redlosk explained in the previous segment with his virtual presidential primary, that resistance has a breaking point. But before you reach it, challenges often backfire. And in many circumstances, in many situations, the information deficit model just fails completely. If you recall, this was the topic in our second episode in this series. Once information has become interwoven with a person's personal identity, cultural identity, or fundamental worldview, threatening that information raises alarms about the decoherence of the entire model of reality they use to make sense of everything. Even if it's not their entire model of reality, it could be some small model, and they have a commitment, a motivation to not believe you, to protect it. Or as Steinbeck wrote, sometimes a man wants to be stupid. If it lets him do a thing, his cleverness forbids. Now, the easiest example, I guess, is that of, of uh, smoking. If you're a chain smoker and you're addicted to nicotine, well, you really don't want to hear that this is going to kill you. So... Um, it is understandable if somebody says, oh, whoa, 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 yeah, you know, the doctors are saying this, but actually, you know, they're saying it because they want to make money and the federal government is paying them to do this and it's all hippies or socialists or regulations or whatever, you know. Lewandowski has several pieces of advice for dealing with the worldview backfire effect. First of all, he says, if you can, avoid arguing with people on the fringes. Those are the people for whom maintaining a misperception might be so fundamental to their core beliefs that you're guaranteed a long and difficult battle. And that's not to say it's impossible to reach them. It's just that that same effort could instead be directed toward the undecided, toward the persuadable, who in many issues make up a larger portion of the population. Changing their minds will push the fringes into an even narrower slot in the distribution of ideas, making the influence of the fringes less of a concern on issues facing large groups. But here's the thing. As the Leadership Lab's field organizer, Steve DeLine, told me in our episode about deep canvassing, even among the persuadable, you must treat each conversation as an attempt for you and the other person to solve a mystery together and not as an attempt to change the other person's mind. If, if you walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to change your mind guess what? They're going to say, whoa, 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 <laughs> hang on, no way. But if you walk up to people and effectively say the opposite, you say, look, I don't want to change your mind. I don't care what you think. I think what you're thinking is just great. 
However, here's a couple of other things you might want to consider. Well, that's a completely different approach. That, that makes people more uh, susceptible to, to, to listening to you. If you do happen to find yourself dealing with someone who is deeply entrenched, Stephen says reframing the message is key. Research shows that using words like carbon offset instead of carbon tax greatly improves the chances of a successful persuasion attempt. You may have noticed that people on both sides employ this tactic already, using phrases like death tax or death panels, words already charged with emotional associations that can be used to encourage the backfire effect as much as they can be used to avoid it. And his third piece of advice is to do what groups like the Nudge Unit do in the UK, which is to not worry about people's worldview or belief at all. Just focus on people's behaviors instead. The research is clear that belief often follows behavior. For instance, if you want people to wash their hands a certain number of times a day while working in a restaurant, factory, or hospital, instead of spending time on training courses that are largely ineffective, the Nudge Unit recommends that employees just get a stamp at the beginning of the day on top of their hands made with a special vegetable dye that will scrub off after a certain number of washings. The places where this has been implemented in the real world not only see a massive initial increase in hand washing, but over time, the behavior becomes routine and normal, and it establishes a new belief in the importance of this practice. Many of our beliefs about what is normal and what is taboo follow from this kind of Invisible behavioral modification. Um, you don't have to convince people that smoking is dangerous. You just got to change their behavior by making it harder to smoke in public, for example. Stephen's fourth piece of advice concerning the worldview backfire effect is to try to seek self-affirmation. <laughs> as strange as this sounds, research suggests that if you ask people to consider how they have acted on their values in the past in a way that makes them feel really great about themselves they're much less likely to reject challenges to their beliefs than people who don't get a chance to think these nice, positive thoughts about themselves beforehand. So, for example, if you take somebody who's a supporter of the free market, you can get them to relate an experience when they felt really great about these values. And then maybe they will say something like, well, I was an entrepreneur when I was 22, and... You know, I bought my first Mercedes when I was 23, and wow, that was really cool. And then you say, right, brilliant. Now, how about climate change? And if you do this right, then you can show in the laboratory that affirming people's fundamental beliefs makes them more able to process information that's challenging to those beliefs. So they feel good about who they are. And then you say, you know, well, yeah, sure, you can be, uh, you know, in favor of the free market. But that doesn't mean you can't buy a solar panel or whatever. And or that doesn't mean that there isn't climate change and that we have to deal with it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is not well understood. We don't know how this really works, but it seems to be a way to psychologically move the threat to identity off the table. This is it, folks. It's the 2018 midterm elections, and the outcome will change our country for decades to come. And with that weight on our shoulders, let's take a minute to remind ourselves of something. The primaries are over, the candidates are set, and we can feel good knowing that many new progressive faces are among them. The disagreements and infighting amongst the left will always be there, but right now, we have to focus on the bigger picture. Now is the time to volunteer, to get out the vote, canvas, call, text, and email while keeping the most vulnerable among us in mind, especially those who face Republican-imposed barriers to casting their vote on Election Day. Democrats across the country, spanning the left side of the political spectrum, need to win, and they need to win big to overcome gerrymandering. There is just no other way to look at this. So take a moment today to figure out how you are going to make a difference in these historic and critical midterm elections. Whether it's helping people get registered, volunteering to drive people to the polls, helping someone get the necessary form of ID, 
canvassing and calling on behalf of candidates, or all of the above. We all have a role to play, and I know none of us want to wake up on November 7th and feel like we should have done more. For the next two months, in every episode, we are going to highlight the battleground races in the U.S. Senate and House so that you know where your help and donations are needed most. We're starting with California, where there is actually still one race impacting the heart of the Democratic Party. The way California's elections work, Senator Dianne Feinstein is facing a fellow Democrat this November. Kevin DeLeon is a state senator who is laser-focused on Medicare for All and tried to get it through the state Senate. Feinstein opposed it. In a surprise twist, DeLeon is the one who secured the California Democratic primary endorsement. As for U.S. House seats, there are six California districts with Republican incumbents where Clinton won in 2016. Two of those are open seats. They are all considered battleground districts with four considered toss-up races, according to the Cook rating. In California's 10th district, Democrat Josh Harder is facing Republican incumbent Jeff Denham. This is a diverse district, and the race is being called a toss-up. The Latino voter turnout, which usually plummets in midterm elections, is critical here. In California's 25th district, Democrat Katie Hill is facing Republican incumbent Steve Knight. This race is also considered a toss-up, and Latino voter turnout here is again key. In California's 39th district, which includes Orange County and parts of Los Angeles, a longtime Republican incumbent is not running for re-election. The Democrat in this race is Gil Cisneros, and he faces Republican Young Kim. This race is considered a toss-up, but the demographics have shifted dramatically in this district, meaning conservative Orange County may not carry as much weight this time around. In California's 45th district, Democrat Katie Porter is facing Republican incumbent Mimi Walters. This is a white-collar suburban district, and the race is currently rated as leaning Republican. In California's 48th district, Democrat Harley Ruda is facing Republican incumbent Dana Rohrabacher. This district is also considered white-collar suburban, but this House race is considered a toss-up. In California's 49th district, Democrat Mike Levin will be facing Republican Diane Harkey in November. The district is currently leaning Democratic. Again, all of these Republican-held districts were won by Clinton in 2016, so they are obviously winnable with the right organizing and get-out-the-vote efforts. To vote in the California midterm elections, you need to be registered to vote online or have your physical application postmarked by Monday, October 22nd. Absentee ballot requests must be received by October 30th. Early voting dates vary by locality. As for your own state, it's never too early to check registration cutoff dates and absentee ballot requests and submission dates. We highly suggest reviewing your state's important dates and voter ID laws at rockthevote.org as soon as possible to ensure you will be able to vote in the general election. Links to all of the information you heard today, as well as additional sources, are linked in the show notes. And today's Midterms Minute, just like every activism segment we produce, is archived and organized under the Activism tab at bestofleft.com. So if making the blue wave a reality in November is important to you, be sure to hit the share buttons to spread the word about supporting Democrats in battleground races across the country via social media so that others in your network can spread the word too. I think liberals have a very hard time understanding their role in creating the market for Trump. I think we have a view of ourselves that has a bunch of blind spots in it in terms of how we're showing up. I've gone all across the country. Um, I've got a chance to go to West Virginia, um, the red parts of Indiana, Michigan, um, even the red counties in California. I've gone to the border. And it gives you the chance to really kind of see the world, you know, from the other side as a liberal, as a progressive. One of the things I think that we don't understand, and we have a hard time getting our heads wrapped around, is we often commit the same mistakes with people in the red states that we accuse conservatives of, com- of committing. For instance, if you only listen to NPR, only watch CNN, and only read the, the New York Times, and say, I know what's happening, then you're committing the same kind of mistake as somebody who only reads, I don't know, the Wall Street Journal, watches Fox News, and 
you know, uh, you know, listen to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. Which is not to say that CNN is as far left as Fox is to the right. It's to say that there's a particular set of assumptions that you're being reinforced in, a particular set of ideas. And, and so you might assume then that any rational person would be outraged by what you're outraged by and even has the same information that you have. But that's just not true. We can sometimes come across in ways that are offensive to people who are in the red states and who are conservative, which shocks a lot of liberals. They say, I'm not offensive, and I'm not offending anybody. I'm liberal, I'm for everybody. I believe in diversity, I believe in inclusion. But it sounds the same way when conservatives, you know, a lot of times you challenge conservatives, they say, listen, sometimes you guys sound really racist. Oh my God, I'm not, I have a racist bone in my body. You're nuts. Quit playing the race card on me. It's the same basic thing. Listen to what folks are saying. I listen to liberals and they say, they basically treat red states the same way that colonizers treat third world countries. These are ignorant backwaters in the South, full of unwashed, uneducated, dumb people. And what we need to do is convert them to our NPR religion and force feed them some kale so they can actually you know, rise to our level. And once they r rise to our level, then they'll be smart enough to quit falling for dumb you know, tricks from their Republican masters. I and mean, you're just like, do you hear yourself? Do you hear how you sound? Nobody should follow anybody who thinks that way about them. Just like most people of color will never follow a lot of the Republican Party as it talks about people today because you don't have any respect. You don't understand what you're talking about. You're looking down on us and then telling us that we're dumb if we don't vote for you. No, we're dumb if we vote for you. <laughs> and it's the same way in reverse. Let me tell you the kind of stuff liberals say all the time that liberals think you know, is perfectly reasonable, perfectly rational, um, and is offensive and wrong. Liberals say about conservatives, especially low-income white conservatives who vote for Republicans, that these people are voting against their own economic self-interest, and it's because they're you know, not well-educated. If they really understood what was going on, they'd never vote for these people because they're voting against their economic self-interest, which is stupid. Okay, let's take that apart. Do you know the white people who consistently vote against their own economic self-interest? I'll tell you who. Rich white liberals who vote for tax increases to pay for programs their kids will never use. They're voting against their economic self-interest. We don't think that makes them ignorant, stupid, dupes. We think that makes them awesome. That's the best thing about rich white liberals, is that they put their values over their money. Their values are more important than their money. They don't just care about money, they care about their values. Interesting. Huh. So if you put your values over your money, you are a noble person. You're not an idiot. You're a noble person. Well, that low-income white guy who's been voting for Republicans the whole time will tell you, well, guess what? I'm putting my values over the money. And I'm telling you, I don't want America's government to go and rob some rich family and take their money and bring it over to my house and try to, 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 to bribe me. See, I don't want America's government to rob a rich family and use the money to try to bribe me to be dependent on them or anybody else. I don't want America's government to take that money and undermine my parenting choices. If my kids are so stupid, they drop out of school, get on drugs and have a bunch of babies, I don't want the government to bail them out. Let them learn a tough lesson, that that's a dumb way to live your life. I'm putting my values of independence, see, and common sense over whatever money the government might be able to give me. Even if it hurts me economically, my values are more important. Now listen, I would disagree with that guy. Is that a great strategy for building a middle class? I disagree. 
but I wouldn't say the guy's stupid. I wouldn't, I, I can disagree without disrespecting. See, we don't have to agree. In fact, the whole point of democracy is you get to disagree. Dictatorship, you can't disagree. <laughs> democracy, you get to disagree. That's called freedom. We like that. That's good. But you don't have to disrespect and you shouldn't disregard. And these are the kinds of mistakes that liberals make every day. And you see them on TV, you hear them on the radio, you see them. And if you are that red state voter, the one thing you know is these people hold me in contempt. They look down on me, they don't respect me, they don't understand me, and now I can't vote for them. Uh, and that's a big part of what's going on. We, we are not as good as we think we are with this inclusion thing, <laughs> with this understanding thing, with this empathy, empathy thing. A lot of us grew up in neighborhoods or in circumstances where, you know, the straight white male had power and was abusing that power. And so we were formed in opposition to that abuse of power. And it's very hard for us to, to actually be able to go on the other side and say, wait, there may be some situations and circumstances where maybe we've got some power that we aren't using fairly, where we may have come to some assumptions or some conclusions or have some prejudices that in some circumstances, we may be the ones who are uh, mistreating people or, or misunderstanding people. That's tough because when you've been in that one down situation and been mistreated for so long and you still are being mistreated as a woman, as a person of color, as LGBT, and you're still being triggered every day and you're still being re-traumatized every day. For somebody to say, yes, and the truth is messy, there may be some situations where maybe you're reenacting some of the very things that you would never want. And you may be showing some prejudices, even though you've been a victim of prejudice your whole life. Nobody wants to hear that. But that's a part of what's happening. And so without ever relaxing our relentless fight for justice for the people who have been traditionally left out, we also have to start opening our heart a little bit more and our ears a little bit more for people who may now newly be feeling left out, either because their economic situation is stagnant or declining, or maybe because they just don't fit in to the new arrangement the way they used to. And so they may have some hurts. They may have some ouchies. They may have some need for a hug and some understanding. And that's the next level. Once we do that, we'll be fine. I believe we can peel off enough uh, people who may have voted for Trump or who may, have, who may have stayed home that we'll be all right. But if we're not willing to look in the mirror, we're going to end up where we're headed. And where we're headed is very bad. I, I think the fundamental thing that I would say to conservatives is that um, it appears that what we used to call conservatism has been replaced by something else. And it's a very sneaky set of maneuvers has given us not true conservatism, but just anti-liberalism. And that that is a fundamental problem. Um, a conservative would defend America from all enemies, foreign and domestic, including any allegation that a foreign power tried to mess with our democracy. Uh, we would expect our conservative friends to be at the forefront of defending American democracy, but that is no longer kosher because it would put you in bed with the liberals <laughs> who are screaming about Russian interference. And so I'm not going to defend the country because I, I got to stay anti-liberal. I got to be against the liberals. Um, there are so many conservative opportunities to make real progress in unlikely communities, but for some reason they don't do it. Who is more passionate about marriage and adoption than Republicans who are pro-family and anti-abortion and lesbian and gay couples who want to get married and adopt kids? So the two biggest champions of marriage and adoption um, uh, 
don't work together because Republicans don't see their ally. They literally don't see the, that the LGBT community is actually the one community in America that whose, whose marriage rates are going up <laughs> as opposed to every, all the rest of us and who, who understand the need for adoption and are fighting for it. The Muslim community should be embraced and celebrated by conservatives because look at the work ethic, look at the low div- divorce rate, look at the incredible premium on entrepreneurship and education, uh, look at the commitment to family and faith. The Muslim community is right picking for conservatives, but instead they're all Al Qaeda. They're all lumped into you know the most negative category. So I mean I think that um, you know same with African Americans. Um, the two strongest institutions in the black community, hip hop and the church. Churchgoers, that's some Republican stuff. Most Democrats are you know on secular thing or spiritual but not religious. Um, African Americans, incredibly strong churchgoers. Hip hop, nobody's rapping about being on welfare. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about material access, and, and it, you know that that's very very consonant with Republican values. But the only thing you hear about black folks on a lot of the conservative uh, uh, you know, TV stuff is all negative. Um, there's no celebration of our religiosity, our entrepreneurial drive. It's just it's just all look at these lazy criminals. Well, when you don't find a way to connect with African Americans, Muslims, LGBT stuff, on stuff you actually agree on, that's when people start asking tough questions about what is this conservatism? It seems to be marbled with a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with conservative ideas. Some anxieties, some maybe bigotries, some antagonisms, maybe some white solidarity identity politics or white grievance politics, something else is in the batter than just conservative ideas because conservative ideas could play very well um, you know, across the, the, uh, the, the, the demographic spectrum. And so I don't want Republicans to stop being Republicans. I think I've never seen a bird fly with only a left wing or only a right wing. A bird need, needs two wings to fly. I want, so you need conservatives, you need liberals, but we need better conservatives. We need conservatives who really are willing to put the country first, who not only just say, well, I don't, I'm not you know, prejudiced, I would never, who, well, well, if you don't just say it, then show it, do it. Um, you're concerned about what's going on in Chicago, um, and you want to say, oh, well, look at those black people killing each other. No, no, those are Americans dying in Chicago. Um, oh, you know, the police are killing black people. No, police are killing unarmed Americans. American police are killing unarmed Americans. Show up. Go to the funerals. Talk to the grandmas. Show how your conservative ideas can help. Jack Kemp did that. I haven't seen a Jack Kemp Republican in, since he died. So you ask the question, what would I say to conservatives? I would say... Stay conservative. I'm going to stay liberal. We can constructively disagree and make the country better. I'm going to try to make the Democrats better, but you've got to try to make Republicans better. It's not that you're conservative. It's that you've now become, you've curdled into something that's more anti-liberal than actually for ideals and ideas that could appeal to everybody and bring the country together. Get back to that and we'll be better off. Lewandowski calls what I'm about to tell you filling the gap. 
but I've also heard it referred to as replacing a load-bearing wall. So you need some kind of metaphor to make sense of it. Personally, I prefer replacing the leg of a table because I like to imagine people's mental modules are sitting on tables like they have in war rooms with toy soldiers, toy tanks, you know, sticks pushing it all around. And if what you're suggesting to someone makes them think that they must give up something as fundamental as a leg of that table, then you must swoop in immediately with a new leg if you have any hope of that person accepting your proposition, because they simply can't allow that whole model to fall over and collapse. If you don't do this, if even over the course of the conversation it becomes extremely obvious to a person that they're wrong, the threat of decoherence will not allow them to accept that wrongness. My favorite example of this, my absolute favorite, is this study from the early 1990s in which people read about a warehouse fire. Now, it was totally made up. It was absolute fiction. But these people, they were asked, based on what they had read in that story, what they thought might have caused the fire. Now, one group's story mentioned that there was a closet in the factory that contained paint cans and gas cylinders. Now, the other group, though, they read that story and it didn't say there was anything in that closet. It actually said that that closet was empty. Later on in the story, if it had mentioned those cans and cylinders, there was a correction, and that correction stated that they had been incorrect. There was a mistake. The closet was, in fact, empty. When scientists asked the subjects in these two different groups why they thought the fire produced a great deal of smoke, the people who read about the full closet that they later learned was empty, still cited those non-existent paint cans as the cause. Except there was no oil paint, because the cupboard was actually empty. Some even said that the stuff in the closet caused the entire fire, not just the smoke. What they don't say is, I don't know. They can tell us that they know it's wrong, but it's much, much harder for them to, to actually fix their situation model. Because how do you represent the event now when all of a sudden a key causal piece of information is gone? And of course, the people in the other group who never heard the misinformation, they had other ideas about the cause and, you know, they never mentioned paint cans because why would you? It's an odd item to conjure up. But here's one of the most amazing things I have ever learned in psychology. When you add a third group to this experiment and you give them that same correction, yes, I know I told you the closet had paint cans in it, but actually that turned out not to be true. But you also tell them that there was a room containing lighter fluid and old rags. People never mention the paint cans. Never again. They easily, freely, and without resistance give up that misinformation and replace it with the better explanation instead. In the study, the authors say that once a person has created a causal narrative out of their logical inferences, that narrative will resist any change that threatens to cause the whole thing to fall apart, even if that means keeping the inferences that they know <laughs> are indefensible. So what we find generally is that when we correct a story that people say, oh yeah, I know. You corrected this. You told me the, the cabinet was empty. Yeah, 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 I know that. But then when we ask them to make use of the information, they're referring to stuff that they know is false. And they rely on this misinformation. And this is called the continued influence effect. Uh, effect and it is pervasive. Lewandowski and Cook in the handbook, when they're commenting on this, they say, quote, People prefer an incorrect model over an incomplete model. In the absence of a better explanation, they opt for the wrong explanation. And that reminds me of this great quote by Bertrand Russell. And he said, Man is a credulous animal and must believe something. In the absence of good grounds for belief, he will be satisfied with bad ones. I mean, we have shown this in... <sighs> countless experiments and studies with, with, you know, subjects around the world. And there's absolutely no question that this is what happens. People continue to rely on information even after we tell them it's false. What makes the warehouse fire study so illuminating for me is that it is absolutely apolitical. 
devoid of all those confounding variables that come with our most deeply held beliefs. And people have only held these beliefs in the study concerning that story for half an hour. And it's just a story. It's fiction. And they know it. Yet, here they are, defending this erroneous belief, citing misinformation they know has just been debunked. And to me, this reveals so much about the underlying mechanisms behind motivated reasoning, selective skepticism, confirmation bias, disconfirmation bias, attitude bolstering, models of reality, and all those things that blend into the backfire effect. And the lesson, I think, is this. When correcting people, never leave that gap. If you set out to bust people's myths, big or small, without a plan, a really good, well-thought-out, informed-by-social-science plan that takes into account emotions and politics and everything else, if you don't have that plan for simultaneously replacing those myths that you're about to remove, you will do more harm than good. This show runs on recurring donations from listeners just like you who signed up to support the show on Patreon for as little as a couple bucks a month. I want to remind you that we've been making a lot of behind-the-scenes changes here, all geared to serve you better. It's kind of hard to describe since I don't really talk about my production process all that much, but you can think of it this way. For the last year or so, we've had this suitcase, but instead of it being full of clothes, It's been full of work, and I just couldn't get it to close all the way, no matter how hard I pushed. So recently, we stopped pushing, dumped everything out of the suitcase onto the floor so we could look at it closely, and then very carefully figured out how we could rearrange everything so that it fit better. The result is that we are back to our old schedule of eight new episodes each month with occasional reruns, rather than six new episodes each month with regularly scheduled reruns. Plus, we're putting out more bonus episodes for members than before. In the last couple of bonus episodes, I started using bonus clips in addition to our regular commentary and conversation. And the bonus show that's coming out with today's episode expands on today's theme and is very much related to the clip you just heard and the power of replacing one idea with another. Except in the bonus clip, it's about how Trump was able to argue the idea that America has been losing, which makes people feel sad and vulnerable, and convert that sadness into anger by pointing to poor brown people as the cause of our losses. So it's an insightful conversation that I just didn't have time for on today's show, uh, so you're going to want to check that out. So if you want to support the show and reward our efforts to not just work harder, but smarter and give you more bang for your buck, sign up at patreon.com slash left. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash left. Or you can also find links to Patreon on the Contribute tab at Best of left.com. Generally speaking, I am willing to be totally over most of the literature of the self-help movement of the 70s and 80s and absolutely everything that psychology today ever published. But if you don't mind me snatching just a little gem from the dung heap of pop psychology, The very popular book of the 1970s, Dr. Eric Burns' Games People Play, diagrammed the interactions of the id, the ego, and the superego in our communication and relationships with one another. To make it a little bit easier to understand, he called our three ego states the parent, the adult, and the child. Our prejudices, our immediate decisions, almost always come from the parent. You you literally memorize your parents' opinions, judgments, teachings, and they exist in your mind forever. And so anytime you make a snap decision, it is coming from your parent ego state because it doesn't require thought. You couldn't get through the day if you didn't have a parent ego state. You don't, uh, you know how some people will walk into McDonald's and just stand there mesmerized by the menu and it's like, get out of the way, it's McDonald's. You know, I can cover my eyes, I can read it to you from left to right, I can tell you everything. But, but our parent ego state holds all of those 
instantaneous decisions. And you can even see certain body language aspects of when you're about to speak out of your parent ego state. If, if someone is raising their finger when they speak to you, or if they have to stand up to deliver their lines, they are entering their parent ego state. The child ego state, oh well, well religion also resides there. Um, even elderly couples will sometimes, you'll hear people that have been married for 50 years, a husband will say to his wife, did you really spend money on that? It's here from the store in a bag, there's a receipt. <laughs> but that is a parent speaking to another adult, their spouse, as a child. It's, it's shaming uh, kind of communication. Or would you please start doing the dishes, your own dishes, or wash your own clothes? We oftentimes start conversations in a parent voice to a child. Dr. Byrne asks his readers to see that the parent voice in us is trying to control others through shame and dogmatic statements, but the child in us the child is where the playfulness is, that's fun and irresponsible, but the child also demonstrates inadequacy. Like when someone says, you know, we've agreed to a meeting next week on Wednesday at, at noon, and they say, will you call and remind me? They are a child speaking to me as if I were their parent. I adopted one little Asian girl 30 years ago, and I've not adopted anybody since. So when someone... <laughs> When someone says, will you call me and remind me of the meeting? I say, no, but I'll loan you $5 so you can buy yourself a calendar. <laughs> what I could say is, no, but I'll tell you what, I'll remember it and I'll expect you to do the same. Yeah. You know, you can, you can change the nature of the dialogue. You see, it's one thing for us to call our president a liar, because he is. But it's another to remain in the adult mode. And then when Trump says that Germany is entirely controlled by Russia because they get 70% of their energy from Russia, we could start name calling and you know, making other, you know, when someone speaks to you from the child ego state, they are trying to either drag you down to the child or force you to be a parent. But you can choose to say, Actually, Germany gets 22% of their energy from Russia, all in the form of natural gas, only because they don't want to burn as much coal. But they've got a 500-year supply of coal, and any day that Russia acts badly, they can start burning coal again. Now, you, you can speak from your adult to the adult and the other person, and they may choose to reply, fake news. <laughs> and again, that's an invitation for you to come down to the child and say, you're a moron, which can be satisfying at a certain level, but not helpful. You keep coming back. When someone is trying to push you into being a parent or a child, you keep speaking as an adult to the adult in them. <clears throat> also, Germany is adding more solar power and wind generated power every day, and that many days in Germany, they are entirely energy to, uh, independent based on renewables. That's an adult response. And the more you give adult to adult responses, <clears throat> the more they are encouraged to join you there. When he says that uh, the United States pays for 90% of NATO's expenses, you can say, actually it's 17, 70%. It's not 90%, it's 17%, and, and quite a bargain at that. When we shame our Trump-supporting family members and friends for having voted for a child-stealing, misogynistic, Islamophobic, xenophobic moron, <laughs> then we are taking the parent role of judging and shaming our relatives who have decided to act like children. What we want to do is try to engage them as an adult to say, um, a friend of mine ad adopted a Guatemalan and I went down and helped her get him and he is now a teenager who's a big 
Trump supporter, and I'd like to say, is is that uh, is that perhaps uh, self-loathing that you you're supporting a person that hates brown people? You know, I think you really need to invite people to come back to an adult evaluation rather than for me to say, I found you in the jungle and brought you here and you should act better, which is true. I found him in the jungle (laughs) and I brought him here. But the larger point is you're a brown American and you want to be careful about supporting a racist. You don't speak to their child. You you don't speak to their parent. You try to speak as an adult to an adult. And it may take months. It may take dozens of exchanges. But the hope is that we will have more adult conversations and less name calling and shaming. About 25 years ago, I was visiting a counseling client who was a patient at the Marion Center, a local mental hospital. And she'd gone through a painful divorce and then had some rocky relationships afterwards. And she began trying to manipulate her her parents, her ex-husband, her boyfriends that were trying to get rid of her through suicidal gestures. So she had made four or five symbolic gestures at killing herself. And finally, the police got involved and she found herself against her will at the Marion Center, and I went to visit her, and she said something to me that day that has stuck with me forever. She said, what I have learned through all this is that if I don't want to be treated as if I were crazy, I need to stop acting like I'm crazy. Traditional expressions of Christianity with all of its Bible studies and sacraments and guilt and shame and fear has not proven effective in stemming the tide of insanity that is currently pouring out of our White House and our Congress. And it is now spreading threateningly into the Supreme Court. Every provocative tweet, every incendiary allegation, every dishonest narcissistic statement invites us to get down into the mud with him and his supporters. And with good reason, I'm just saying, Don't do it. They may deserve to be chastised. Just don't do it. They may be acting like idiots. Just don't call them an idiot. Choose to be an adult who speaks to adults. If shaming people for being ignorant would make them smarter, the Ozarks would be the Mensa Club capital of the world. If provocative name calling and pushback would make people be rational, then Putin would be a Peace Corps volunteer and Kim Jong-un would be a hairdresser. (laughs) But the truth is that what what we have, that we presently in this difficult challenge, we have some hard days ahead of us, which means we have some hard work ahead of us. I wish that all Christians could get their head out of the clouds and stop worrying about heaven and hell and start worrying about kids getting lead poisoning from tap water in Flint and brown kids being put into kitty prison in Texas and Arizona and poor people dying due to lack of access to health care. I don't mind their theological diatribes on baptism, communion, and their tediously repetitious praise hymns. If only they would feed the hungry and house the homeless and care for the sick and welcome the aliens in our midst. To our evangelical friends who may have accidentally found our YouTube channel, (laughs) I have to say, you guys have been going to Bible study all your lives. And when you hear Sarah Huckabee Sanders or Jefferson Beauregard's sessions, tell you that it is biblical to take children away from their parents, you don't need me to remind you that that's not biblical. You don't need for me to tell you that the Bible in their hands is as dangerous as giving the car keys to a drunk Stevie Wonder. (laughs) You already know better. And I know that you are basically good and that removed from your partisan invective 
that there is an adult in you that is ready to return to sanity. I just want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We've just heard clips today, starting with a TED Talk by Rob Willer, in which he describes how to have better political conversations. Next was part one from the You Are Not So Smart podcast, describing the backfire effect. Then you heard today's Midterms Minute, focusing on California swing districts. Van Jones talked on Big Think about the rhetorical and philosophical shortcomings of both liberals and conservatives. Part two of You Are Not So Smart focused on the importance of replacing a debunked theory with a valid one rather than leaving that space empty. And finally, we just heard my friend and yours, Dr. Roger Ray, explaining that no matter how satisfying it may be to shame people for their actions, that's not how we elevate the debate back to a point where we can all get back to having rational conversations again. As always, you can find links to each of these segments in the show notes for easy reference and sharing. And now, we'll hear from you. Hi, Jay. This is a long-time listener and supporter, Michael, from the UK. And uh, my observation or my question is about um, your show on the war on media. In the UK, we have a very mainly right-wing press. Um, The BBC has been long-time supporters of whatever government's in control. And listen to your program about Trump, and something which always comes up to me is whenever I uh, hear the, the Trump uh, jive from their supporters about the, the fake news and how media is always lying, and I, I always kind of can hear myself speaking concerning the, the left side of politics and uh, the establishment kind of war it seems to be in the press with Jeremy Corbyn. So... Um, it's really just a situation. How, how do I know that I'm just, I'm not doing the same thing as the Trump supporter uh, on the right side of the politics uh, and I'm, you know, in another echo chamber myself. Um, I'd welcome your views. I'm going to do as other listeners. Uh, thanks a lot and stay awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Now, a quick response to Michael from the UK. And I got to say, boy, was that a good call to get uh, for today's episode. Uh, You know, he's basically asking, how do I know I'm not falling prey to the backfire effect. I mean, really, like when you listen to his message, you know, how how do I know I'm not doing the same thing as the other side? How do I know I'm not just reflexively rejecting uh, what I see to be the other side? That's all the backfire effect. So uh, now that you know how it works, the key is to not backfire effect yourself. Uh, And so if you only listen to stuff that you completely agree with, and then occasionally hear some things that are wildly opposed to what you believe in, that is how you get entrenched in a single set of beliefs that doesn't change. That's terrible. That that turns into dogma. It it leads to a lot of dangerous places. So this piece of advice has been going around for a little while, and I don't agree with it at all, and I think today's episode explains why that you shouldn't agree with it either. People will often say, make sure to listen to things and hear perspectives that you completely disagree with so that you can get a broader perspective on the world, right? But as we just learned, when you do that, you don't actually broaden your perspective on the world. Best case scenario, maybe you will at least learn what the other side thinks, but you will very much entrench yourself in your own beliefs even more. So here's my advice that I actually believe in and try to practice myself. Consume a range of opinions that are all close to and sort of adjacent to your own. You know, I'm trying to think of like a metaphor to explain this. Like if if you only believe in your own thoughts like you, if, and you only hear things that you already agree with, I feel like that's, it's like standing still. 
even if you look around and you think you see the world in three dimensions, right? If you stand perfectly still and you stare long enough, everything sort of starts to look two-dimensional. Like you lose all this dimension and, and, and nuance in the world. But if you just move side to side a little bit, the world comes to life. Everything starts moving. You get extra depth. You can see around corners maybe you couldn't have seen around before. I don't know. It, maybe it's not a perfect analogy, but you kind of get what I'm going for. So I think you need to listen to things that are adjacent to what you believe in, get a variety of perspectives all on a topic. I, I mean, I know I'm just, I'm trying to describe this show essentially, but you know, you, you try to get a variety of perspectives on a topic and that will move you. You will constantly hear new ideas, new perspectives on something you thought you understood before. And that is what I think gives a person a three-dimensional view of the world. And once you have a three-dimensional view, and it's not just a my opinion and my team versus the other side and their craziness that I don't agree with at all, once you have a, a, a fluid, nuanced, three-dimensional view of the world, then you have infinite flexibility for, for how you can interpret things. And then next to that point is, is this one. This is one of my favorites. Pay attention to whether your views are changing over time. They certainly should be. Uh, one, one of my favorite bits of wisdom is that if you can look back at everything you believed six months ago without cringing, that means you're not growing. So make sure your views keep changing and refining themselves as you gather new and better information and new and interesting perspectives. Okay, so, so that's sort of the uh, groundwork, but getting back to media criticism and, and uh, Michael's question, I would say, first of all, consume enough independent media to get a sense of what mainstream media isn't telling you. To me, the biggest problem with media isn't what they say, it's what they refuse to talk about at all. So uh, personally, I, I would judge media more on what they omit than what they say. And finally, be sure to understand the underlying motivations and incentive structures of whatever media organization you're criticizing. That's that's really what helps make sense of them. So like Michael pointed out, the BBC seems to always support whatever government happens to be in power at the time. And in the US, our media is pretty well dominated by corporate media, which always supports corporations. So it's a complete misdirection to think that any of this is a right-left issue. Almost no mainstream media is ideological at all. They just are driven primarily by their built-in incentive structures. And that doesn't mean that every person who works there doesn't have their own opinion and that every person who works there isn't themselves ideological. But the way a corporation works, and the BBC probably to a slightly different degree, the way it works is that people may have their own opinions, but if their opinions differ too much from the core incentive structures of the organization, they are not going to be allowed to have a say. They're not going to be allowed to have a place of power. They may not even be allowed to keep their jobs. So it's not like a nefarious cabal conspiracy that makes that happen. It is natural incentive structures that create an environment in which dissenting opinions are simply not allowed to surface. And that's why I say you should focus more on what an organization isn't saying rather than what they are, because that's how you know what opinions are being systematically shunted to the side. And most of what gets shunted to the side, you can figure out why based on their financial structure. So it's all about incentives, primarily where the organization gets their money from. So to Michael, I would say, I think you're on the right track just by questioning uh, that concept in the first place. And second of all, now that you have a good solid understanding of how the backfire effect works, make sure to implement that in your own life. Uh, make sure to get a range of opinions, have a flexible and thoughtful uh, understanding of the world. And, and I think, I mean, I, I kind of feel this in myself, like the more flexible you get, the, the wider the range you have of opinions that you can tolerate without 
freaking out and getting really entrenched, uh, I feel like then you can kind of flex those muscles and get opinions and consume opinions that are farther and farther afield from what you believe in and just sort of accept them for what they are, hear them out for what they are. And, and, and that helps you understand where other people are coming from and, you know, understand other perspectives and maybe even help understand your own perspective more. I mean, we're kind of getting into like that clip from Van Jones where he, he dissected both shortcomings of liberals and conservatives. Like that's a really important skill to be able to see the holes in your own arguments. So I guess it really just comes down to humans never ending quest for knowledge. And, and I guess maybe what I would boil it down to is to be thoughtful about everything and reactionary about almost nothing. Keep those comments coming in. The number to dial 202-999-3991. That's going to be it for today. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash best of the left. That is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So come to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C. My name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors of the show from bestoftheleft.com. Mm-hmm.